sideroads are not so bad. If you're local, you know whereabouts where you are, you can just stop the car up and hopefully catch a bus home or something and leave the car where it is. But I mean, out on a motorway, the SOS boxes are that far apart or you might not be a member of the RAC or the AA. I mean, what do you do in that situation? What you do is ignore the myths. The greatest risk on the hard shoulder is not from maniac attackers, it's from other drivers ploughing into you. One third of all motorway accidents happen that way. The safety rules are simple. The first thing to do is to get out of the door on the passenger side. Not the most graceful of procedures, but at least it's practical because it keeps you away from the fast moving traffic. Then you must look for a marker which will tell you where the emergency telephone is and you're never more than half a mile away from one. And an arrow on the marker will tell you which way to walk. The phone has no dialing tone, so don't suppose that it's not working. The call goes immediately to the police control room. And because this box is coded, they know exactly where you are. And let's explode another myth. Despite the advertising hype, don't suppose that a portable phone is necessarily the best solution, unless, of course, you're disabled. This is not coded. It doesn't tell anybody automatically where you are. And many people who use them don't know what junction they've just passed. Sometimes they don't even know what motorway they're on. Back at the car for the wait, you should either sit up on the verge away from the vehicle with the near side door open, or alternatively, if you can't do that, sit in the car with your seatbelt on, giving the impression that you're waiting for somebody to come back who's accompanying you. When all's said and done, a woman's biggest enemies these days are not men in general or attackers in particular. They are fear and ignorance, currently spiralling out of control. For a summary of our advice for lone women drivers, write to Top Gear Fact Sheet, PO Box 1066, Birmingham, and please enclose a stamped addressed envelope. Nice to know that Triumph watched Top Gear. We tested the new trophy earlier this year. One or two criticisms. The screen wasn't high enough, too much air in the face. Well, as an option, they've given you a higher windshield. We thought the pegs were too high. It was an uncomfortable riding position. They've lowered those right across the range, but they've left the pillion passenger pegs alone, and they're still too high. There was no hard luggage capacity. Here at the show, a pannier kit and a luggage grid. Now, Mark Forsyth's been riding the latest 900cc Trident. And we've also got an exclusive test on the new 750 Daytona. Triumph's approach to building motorcycles may not be new, but it's certainly having the desired effect. The reborn British Mark has surprised the cynics by actually being quite good. Quite very good, in fact. So how have they done it? How have they produced such a Japanese-feeling bike at a mass-produced, Oriental-style price? Simplicity, that's how. A policy of shared parts throughout the range to minimise the need for an extensive stock of different components. Honda may be able to afford to change every component on a bike every year, but Triumph quite sensibly realised that such practices are too costly to contemplate. Every Triumph has the same frame. Every Triumph has a similar engine. Imagine one engine, a 1200cc inline four, chop a cylinder off it and you've got a 900 triple. Put a shorter throw crank in it and hey presto, it's a 750 triple. This is the 900cc Triumph Trident, the long stroke version of the modular engine designed to give maximum grunt at low revs. It's the stripped down bare bones model of the Triumph range. High bars, low foot rests and no fairing for those that like a warm breeze and flies in the teeth. This is the Triumph Daytona 750, a sort of Triumph version of a mid 80s Japanese race replica. It's virtually the same engine as the 900, but uses a shorter throw crankshaft to gain more revs and drop the capacity to 750. It's got all the accoutrements of a boy racer, like the full fairing, the rear set footrest, the clip-on handlebars, semi-adjustable suspension, but it shares the same cycle parts as the rest of the Triumph range, and for that reason alone, feels like a mid-80s Japanese sports bike. Not that there's anything wrong with the cycle parts, it's just that they suit the softer sprung Trident better than the Daytona.
close my eyes to see twelve wild horses in silver chains. Chassis isn't, how shall we say, a sporting affair, and it seems strange to dress it up like one. Our advice is to forget the Daytona altogether and make a beeline for the soulful Trident. It's a peach. Latest Norton F1 sport machine, our Mark IV side's been riding it. Brave chap. My Mark is more the Malaguti scooter, 590 pounds, 18 miles an hour maximum speed, and ideal for getting around a motorcycle show. The Norton F1 was the sort of bike you either loved or loathed, or collected, but its price was the biggest thorn in its side. £13,000 was too much when for half the price you could buy a Kawa Honsuki that would be twice as good. You can't rest on the strength of a name forever, so bearing that in mind, Norton have come up with this new model, the F1 Sport. In theory, this is the new Norton F1 Sport. Rather than the £13,000 of the original F1, this bargain basement model costs a mere £8,999. <clears throat> There'll be a dozen bikes made like this one, but in the interest of cost, the rest of the production run will get slightly more basic suspension, cheaper brakes and heavier wheels. So in actual fact, what you see here is more like an F1 than an F1 Sport. Confused? So are we. The F1 Sport still hunts at low speed like the F1 did, and still behaves unpredictably at idle speeds, but it is an improvement. The tuning potential must be massive, but in this emission-conscious state, it still needs more go to justify the £9,000 price tag. James Whittam won the 1991 Superbike Championship riding a Suzuki GSXR 750. Now, this is the 1992 version of the same bike. The only basic difference being that it's water-cooled. Now, Suzuki say they've done that partly to meet the stringent noise regulations currently coming out of Brussels. Other motorcycle manufacturers are facing similar problems. Kawasaki claimed to have invented the current obsession for the retro look with their launch last year of the 550 and 750 Zephyr. But there ain't no substitute for cubes, as they say. That Kawasaki claim just can't be right. If you really want the retro look, how about a bike that's basically unchanged for 60 years? They've even bought back the wire wheels and the original cylinder heads for that truly authentic look. German from the stolen car squad, how big a problem are stolen motorbikes in the UK? It's epidemic proportions at the moment, unfortunately. 70 a day, 500 a week is an average. Well over 115,000 still shown as missing on our computer. Now, what's the best way to protect your bike from a thief? You need to buy a jolly good alarm and a jolly good lock. The best you can afford, it's going to be worth it in the long run. Um, Lock it to something, lock it to some railings or uh, a lamppost, anything. Don't leave it just through the wheel. What happens to the bikes when they're stolen? All sorts of things happen to them. They usually get stripped down for spares. They may get rebuilt using another frame. We're coming into 1992, the EEC, and one suggests they may go across the water. Well, Yamaha say they haven't gone for the currently fashionable retro look with the new diversion. Instead, they've analysed what somebody like me, who's going back into motorcycling, might want from the machine. Practical bike you can use every day and yet take on a continental tour once a year. Let's see what a younger guy thinks of the machine. Trying to please all of the people all of the time usually ends in tears. Trying to please Mr. or Mrs. Euro Average might seem like a dangerous trap, but Yamaha seem to have succeeded. 
This is the new Yamaha Diversion, a diversion from the usual sports bike rat race, so say Yamaha. It's a follow-on from the humdrum but popular XJ600, and a worthy one too. It's comfy, easy to ride, mild-mannered, economical, cheap and very, very sensible. It might be a bit too sensible for some taste, but don't assume that means boring. After all, it is a motorbike, a 600cc motorbike, and in my book that makes it about 10 billion times more exciting than any car. It costs £3,549 and could prove the ideal way to beat the rush hour traffic without inflicting neck cramps and sore wrists on the rider. Unfortunately, having spent so much time looking at these splendid new bikes, there's no room for the item on Formula One we had planned to bring you this week. But there'll be a chance later in the series to hear world champions Jack Brabham, Denny Holm and Jody Schechter, among others, reminiscing about the great days of the three-litre formula. This is the revolutionary Honda NR750. Why revolutionary? Well, because each of the four pistons in its V4 engine isn't round, it's oval. Each piston thus has space for eight valves and two spark plugs. Now, all that technology means it delivers power like a V8, over 120 brake horsepower through a wide power band. But it's lighter, stiffer, and it has a lot less friction than a V8 would have. They start building them at the rate of just three a day in December, so join the queue now. The price? Ah, it's only 38,000 quid. Now, I always said if I'd had the brakes, I could have been a saloon car racer right up there with them. I never deluded myself I could be a bike racer. This is about the closest to a Formula One machine I'm ever likely to get. Our Mark Forsyth is racing one of these 40cc devices later on this evening. Me, I'm off for a look back round the show. <laughs> The full gamut of motorcycling here at the show, it's open until Sunday. For me, the star has to be Lloyd Williams' fantastic £20,000 Honda Gold Wing. From all of us at the show, good night. Next week, Honda expands the Civic range, and it looks good. How to buy at auction and live to tell the tale. And our Rally Quest winner prepares for the Lombard RAC. On this week's Top Gear car line, you can hear Tiffany Dell's summary of his impressions of the Ginetta G33 on 0898 335578. And Quentin Wilson gives advice on the contentious subject of written off cars being repaired and offered for sale on 0898 335579.